Okay, so the topic is educational leadership, and, and we're going to talk about how uh, some schools are creating the conditions for passion and innovation. And we've done a few things at our school that, that have helped us along the way. Um, and I'm hoping that some of the things we share are practical ideas. They're not going to cost a lot in your budget, um, but are just things that will shift people's mindset around how we can do it. The question is not if we can do it, but, but more so how we can do it. Um, we want people to explore their passions, to be curious, and to innovate. Um, and so it's just about creating the conditions for that to happen. The, the changes that we've had at our school are not significant changes, um, but I think they're ones that can work at, at most schools. And, and I understand context is, is important. Um, being from, from Canada, um, we have a little bit of a, I would say, more flexible system than, than others, um, particularly in the U.S. I'll just start, um, Sarah did mention a few things about me, but uh, first and foremost, I am a, a parent of a twin year old, two-year-old twin girls, and uh, they're in nap time right now, so hopefully <laughs> they nap right through this session. Um, and I'm also a teacher at, uh, and a principal at a uh, school in British Columbia, Canada. Um, in the backdrop, you can see there uh, our beautiful Mount Shiam, and we have built a hill on the back of our school so kids can play on it and roll down it and everything, and that is the view from the top of our hill. Um, I'm kind of a stereotypical Canadian, uh, hockey playing sports nut, um, and uh, yeah, I'm just, it's, again, it's an honor to be here. And uh, the top picture is, is me working with uh, the kids that are passionate about science in our school, and I'll share some of the stuff we're trying to do that because we want to create the culture where it actually shifts down to passion in the classrooms. And then I'm hoping that people at the end will share some of their ideas um, and, uh, and so I can not only share ideas from others but steal from you. So please at the end if you have any questions or ideas uh, please uh, shoot them out and also if you have any questions along the way um, I'll try to read it, but I'm not very good at that. Um, so hopefully uh, Sarah and Mariana can can help uh, keep track of those uh, those questions for me. And I, I'm at an elementary school, and it's K to six, so kindergarten to grade six. Now this is a this is a quote by Aunt Ed Desi and Richard Ryan, and it it really drives all that I do uh, as an educator, as a person, as a leader. And we often hear ways to motivate people. For example. Um, you know, using incentives uh, for staff, merit pay, all this sort of stuff. Don't get me started on that. But um, the what the most important thing to do is create the conditions for people to motivate themselves. Um, when the incentives are not there, are still people motivated, and that's what drives me, and that's what's driven me to to make some of the changes at our school is try to create the conditions for for people to uh, to be innovated and to have the time to do that in our school. So this drives many of the aspects of leadership, and and I was introduced to this uh, through uh, Alfie Cohn as well as uh, um, Daniel Pink's book Drive, um, where a lot of the research out of University of Rochester by uh, Ed Desi and Richard Ryan um, drove what, uh, what was shared by, um, by Pink and Cohn. Now, the leadership and management, and I see this quite regularly, and, and I see, you know, leadership, is, is everyone is gung-ho about leadership and management is kind of given a bad rap. And one of my mentors uh, is, is Kenny Bruce Bearstow from, uh, from BC, and we had a great conversation about a year ago about this, and, and he said, you know, leadership and management are, are the yin and yang. Uh, both are equally important. Um, and I like what George Curl said. He said that leadership should drive management, um, but I also, we, we can't just let management fall off, and, I, and I've made that mistake before, so I think it's important that we, we put great effort into management, because without that management, um, the structures of our school fall apart, and those structures are, are significant, and we'll talk about some of the structures we've done at our, at our school, too, so uh, although leadership is important, we say, you know, I've heard leadership 2.0 is, is where we're at now, and, and leadership 1.0 was, was more management. Um, and I hear what people are saying, but we can't forget how the importance of management. So again, the focus for today will be creating the structures and the conditions to for people to excel. I really believe that um, we need to give give teachers the tools they need to innovate. And if they're passionate in an area, we have to provide those those tools for them to explore that area. And uh, that's helped helped our school significantly. Now, the big criticism that we hear quite regularly, I've just heard this on the radio here, and, and, and I know it's in, in US, um, it's, it's quite a 
people are very critical of the education system. And we also hear that educators are not innovative and they, the school system is stuck back in the past. And, and while I agree with parts of that, um, I, I, I struggle with it. And I'll, and I'll tell you why. Um, I think that, that we, we don't make it a priority. And, and, I, and I'll get into that in a bit. But I want to define innovation. And innovation, I once thought, was doing something new. And although it is, it can be, but what is more important to me in education is taking good ideas and building on them and tweaking them and making them different in the way that works for you school and then sharing them out. Um, because then you have these intellectual collisions that, that happen that actually can make your idea even better. And, um, and that's the benefit of, of social media in that area. Um, so why is it hard to be I guess, I guess, do we lack innovation in education? I say yes, but I think there's a reason we do that. We, we lack it, and, and that's because there's no time. We basically teach and prep and mark. I mean, in BC, uh, in elementary school, teachers get two 45-minute sessions for prep. So in a week, I mean, you can't, you can't prep in that time. You can't mark in that time. And then we say, um, you know, go home, look after your kids, coach. Um, you know, have a little time for yourself and be innovative. And, and it's, it's really difficult to do that. We, we're in a, in a, in a system that, that is a very busy, busy job. And, and some teachers, when they're just starting out, have to work two jobs. Um, and in the U.S., and when some of the salaries are lower, it's experienced teachers are working two jobs. So I think that we need to make time within the schedule, within the 8 to 3 schedule, for teachers and staff to to have the opportunity to be innovative. And there's simple things like, you know, the idea of staff meetings. In, in BC, we, we only meet for 15 hours a year. That's a contractual thing. So we have a, hour, a 10 hour and a half staff meetings, and we have a few professional development days. But during those staff meetings, what's the best use of that time? Is the best use of that time to go through a list of, of, of you know, information? Um, we often hear the, the flipped faculty meetings. I don't, I'm not sure I'm, I'm sold on that term. I just think we need to be reflective on how we're going to use that time when we're together. Um, because that's the time where the magic can happen. That's where you have the entire room and you can bounce ideas off each other. So if innovation is important and passion is important, why do we have no time in our schedule for that? Um, it's a bit absurd. and so. I think we need to work hard to, to create time within that schedule, schedule for that. And, and I understand the professional learning community model. Um, however, that can be a little top down sometimes, and it's very directed. Whereas what we're going to talk about today is, is trying to create more innovative, uh, more autonomy around that um, in our schools. Um, and when I mention autonomy, um, sometimes that can, can be a bit controversial. Um, because autonomy to me is not I get to do whatever I want. Um, it's, it's, uh, I'll use uh, Joseph Blaze. Uh, he talks about autonomy to do something, not autonomy from doing something. Um, so I think that we have to create a balance of staff development and staff learning with personal learning as professionals. And so keeping that professional autonomy, it, it's, it's not just getting to do whatever we want. It's, it's doing it that aligns with where we're going as a school. So it's professional autonomy um, to do what we, we, we want to learn about. Uh, that's been a, a good shift at our, our school. Uh, a friend of mine, Tom Shimmer, talks about how we want professional learning to be as bottom up as possible and as top down as necessary. And sometimes you need very little top down, depending on your staff. But sometimes you need a little bit of top down to create a bit of structures around that. Um, and that's the role of uh, educational leaders as well as, uh, and when I say educational leaders, I'm not talking about just administrators. I'm talking about anybody that wants to step up in a leadership role. Um, so what is this teacher leadership? Um, we have staff in our school that just are crying to lead. They want to lead. And it's, it's fantastic because I just have to step back, I, you know, let go a little bit and provide the time and the conditions for them to lead. So whether we have a special education assistant, um, a First Nation support worker or Aboriginal support worker, a teacher, um, a counselor, we, we want to tap into that. We don't want to basically put the lid on anybody. If someone has a strength, we want to embrace that. If someone has an interest or a passion, we want to go, from, go with that. And I think that, that filters down too to our students because we can lead from within. Um, many feel that, that from what I've talked to in, in schools, they don't have the opportunity to lead. They'd like to, but they don't have the opportunity. And I don't think everybody wants to, but I think there are a number of people that don't, um, that don't get that opportunity because of 
sort of a hierarchical way of, of leading. Um, and when I talk about strengths, this, I love this picture. This is, this is our hill. Um, and uh, those are our kids up there showing their, their strengths <laughs> on top of the hill. Um, in education, we often, often have, a, have a deficit model of thinking of, of what, what we can do to improve what we're doing wrong. And um, we, we, we need that model of what we can do to improve. But it doesn't, we don't always have to just solely focus on what we're doing wrong. There's so many things we're doing right, and we're, we could be better in those areas. And, and I think with kids as well as with staff, if you tap into those strengths, you'll see, um, you'll see your school flourish. And we have, uh, I use the term run with the runners. You know, we have, we have uh, people that just want to run. They're just going. They're moving. And, and I want to provide the, the conditions for that to, for, and the tools for them to keep running. And um, I also understand the role of bringing an expert in. I get it. Um, sometimes we need that to, to kick us off in a direction. Um, but I, I think too often that's the focus is, okay, we're going to bring in an expert. They're going to tell us what to do. We're going to go to a conference. We're going to listen to experts. They're going to tell us what to do. And then we go back to our school and really nothing changes. Um, so providing time for teachers to meet within the school to explore some of these and explore their learning and, and bring it into our schools can, can really help. Um, I think she someone mentioned custodians. We had we had a custodian last year that ran our um, our environmental club, and uh, and they made changes. They changed. We got all our lights changed to uh, the the more energy efficient light bulbs. Uh, we had better seals done on our doors. All this sort of stuff came from a custodian that wanted to lead. So uh, thanks for for adding that. Who's that? Peggy. Thanks for that. Um, and as I said before, I think sometimes we just need to let go. You know, it, it, uh, if you try to micromanage everything, I don't, I don't know how people do that. It would be just stressful all the time. But, yeah, just let go. And, and I have to talk about my district because um, we're a very small district. We don't have a lot of uh, formal uh, leaders above principals. We have a, a superintendent and a director of instruction and then, and then principals. And, and, and uh, so I'm provided with a lot of opportunity um, by our Board of Education where, where they just kind of just say, you know what, try it. And then we'll check, you know. So it's that feedback loop, and and I think that's a, a it filters down to the staff because if I have the autonomy, then I feel I can try something, and why not give that to teachers who are then going to give that to students? And and as much as I'm and I don't want to talk about the hierarchy, but I think that when when the board and when your superintendent sets that tone, that that can be very powerful for everyone else. Um, and then the, the the focus on the growth mindset. I love Dweck's work and uh, the. We, we, have to, we have to be learners, and we can always get better in areas. Um, and again, that, that we're modeling that to kids. It's not, we're not a fixed mindset where we're, just, uh, we're, we're not going to go anywhere at this from where we're at. We can always grow. We can always learn um, as, a, as a staff, and that comes down to our students. So well, some of the things that we've done at, at our school, um, and this has kind of evolved from when I was a vice principal, and, and the, the principal at our school um, really uh, we had similar philosophies. And so we started with something called choices because we wanted an opportunity for staff to teach in an area of passion. Um, so once a week for 45 minutes on Wednesday afternoons, staff would have the opportunity to offer in an area of their passion for, and then students would choose to attend that activity. They would have to attend one activity throughout the year, throughout the school, uh, and would go for six weeks, and then they would change. And so we have had things like the, the picture there is, is, is a, a teacher that did CSI. She loves science, and um, and she had some connections with uh, with the community where she could get some of the uh, the bunny suits there. And and so she had these crimes set up, and kids had to use scientific methods to explore this. So I mean, you talk about the curricular outcomes there; they're all there. So it's not just like we're throwing out activities that, that don't even align. We've had, uh, we've had people bring in engines, uh, combustion engines. We've had, uh, I've, I'm doing scratch right now, the, the, um, the coding for kids. Um, we do arts, you know, uh, stencils, uh, sketching, uh, all sorts of stuff, uh, music, dance, everything. And uh, what it does is the kids get to, to find an, era, an interest and um, the staff get to teach in an area of their passion. And it's been... It's been amazing because you walk, I get to walk. I teach one section of it. We have two sections. I get to walk around and see that and, and ask me how many behavior problems you'd probably have the answer. Everyone's engaged. It's hands-on. We don't have hardly any behavior problems. 
at that time. We have behavior problems in our school, but not <laughs> significantly less at that time. And there's no grades, but there's tons of assessment. Uh, there's always that feedback loop going. Um, it's a lot of coaching that's happening. But yeah, the kids are engaged, they're motivated. Uh, no one's saying, is this for marks? It's just, it just happens uh, at our school. And this has been happening for about six years now. Um, so and, and this, is, this is helping to create a culture of, of passion in our school. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm proud to to be one of the people that have, have brought this to our school, and and um, it happens in another district too. We kind of morph the idea from there, and there's other schools in BC that are doing. They call it the academy, um, where they get to explore uh, areas, and, and kids are proud in their learning in the academy. <laughs> um, we also, um, and another way to to share our passions, um, we do something called Identity Day. And uh, this was originally shared by George Peros about five years ago at his school. Uh, his vice pr or assistant principal uh, came up with the idea. And what it is is that um, staff and students do a project on themselves. And it's an area of passion or interest or culture uh, or family, anything that they want to share about themselves. And again, this is not graded. And you should see the projects that they create. We've had multimedia, I mean, videos and present, I mean, kids doing their own presentations, kids doing contortion in the gym, um, you know, all sorts of um, Aboriginal um, dances and, and people wearing regalia. So this is, this is a picture of one of our staff members. She's a child care counselor. And um, she loves bull mastiffs. And, and if people know me, I actually had a bull mastiff uh, up until a couple years ago. And, um, but she got to share that. And so now the conversation is different because you'll have people that um, will connect with her in a way that, that they didn't before. So you have a, a student that loves dogs. All of a sudden, there's a connection there. And she gets to share who she is. Um, and the best part of, of it for, was from a student. Um, and uh, the mom said she doesn't get, she does, after Identity Day, she doesn't get uh, bullied. And I questioned that. I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, um, instead of people not knowing what to say to them, um, they, to her, um, they ask her to do art for her. She loves drawing pictures of animals. So they bring in pictures of the pets and she draws them for them. They know she has a strength. They know she's proud of who she is. Um, and uh, so uh, although, although we do it with staff as well as students, it, this is probably one of the most powerful things I've ever been a part of. We've done it twice at our school. I've got tons of resources on a, on a, um, on a site that if you, if you can just email me or send me a tweet and I will uh, share that with you. And if you have any questions, by all means, ask, because I think this, uh, this is something that uh, could work in any school. Um, so we started with choices. We went to Identity Day. And then um, after reading Dan Pink's drive, he mentioned um, Google's 20% time. And um, I don't know if people are familiar with the 20% time, but it's basically within the, within the week, they get 20% uh, of their time, so say one day a week, to just explore and be curious and, and, and tinker and, uh, you know, explore hunches. And a lot of things from Google have come out of that. A lot of their most innovative um, uh, ideas have come out of this 20% time. So I was trying to think of ways that we could add that into our school. And uh, it's hard. It's hard. 20% is a lot of time. So what I did is, is I took the Atlassian idea. So there's a company called Atlassian where they do a FedEx day. And so the, they provide one day every once in a while where people get to meet and explore and, and tinker with an idea with the only, um, the only goal is they have to deliver. They have to deliver it back to the staff. And so we didn't do a FedEx day, but I made a FedEx prep. I called it a FedEx prep. And I offered a prep free. So I offered to cover their class for eight classes. Um, that could be over a week. It could be over, well, actually I said it was could be over two weeks. It could be over eight weeks. Um, and the only deal is they have to deliver it back to the staff. And, and so this is the start of me providing a little bit of time. And what came out of that was we had some, some amazing technology, uh, education technology happening in our grade one classroom. And before that, I was preaching they had tech, tech stuff, but no one was buying it. And as soon as we had a teacher, a grade one teacher doing it, people want them both. If, if Karen can do it, then, then why, can't, uh, why can't we do it? You know, just little things like storytelling through Flickr and, uh, you know, um, voice thread and, and things like that. So that all happened with these eight classes, and it was prep free. So she, and, and it's just providing a little bit of time. And um, 
so that's how, how that started. We had other things where um, our school garden, we have a great school garden, so how can we use that in a more curricular area? We had blogging, student blogging, um, Stacey Garriock, who's at Garriock on Twitter. Um, she, she started uh, blogging with, uh, with some of her intermediate students at the time, just learning how to do it. And, and so, again, we all, pe teachers want tons of things. They, they want to do all these things, but we don't have the time. A couple other ideas that I want to share from other schools, um, Josh Stumpenhorst uh, at Stump Teacher, as well as Jesse McLean, um, J. McLean 77 on Twitter. So Josh is from Illinois, and he has done a lot of work uh, with students on Innovation Day. So they have a day where they create or have a they just get to explore and tinker in with an idea, and they have to share it at the end. Um, and what Jesse did was Jesse McLean in Alberta did this for teachers. So they did it in the summertime. They had teachers come in, and they had an innovation day in, uh, for teachers where they could explore. So it's kind of like the FedEx FedEx Day. Um, so uh, check out. I've, I've posted those on the on the um, on the Reform Symposium. The information for my session. I posted links to uh, Jesse's and uh, Josh's information as well as one from Lynn Hilt, uh, at Lynn Hilt on Twitter, um, where she did a sort of FedEx day with her staff. And uh, so they did a bunch of information, sort of typical stuff in the morning, and then they kind of did an unconference ed camp style in the afternoon. And uh, she said it was one of the most powerful professional learning experiences that she's had on her staff. Um, so lots of things where if you just ask the question, how do we create more time within this? How do we create time for teachers to explore and innovate? So this is what we've done this year. So um, I was asking the question, how do we create time for teachers to collaborate? So how do we create time within the day for teachers to collaborate and, 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 and discuss ideas, um, be curious, explore hunches, bounce those hunches off each other, and share? And and I met a lady on Twitter named Janet Lauman, and she's from BC, and she did a, her doctorate thesis on uh, learning communities in British Columbia. And what she found was the, the PLC model didn't work very well in BC. And uh, there's many reasons for that. I'm not really going to get into it. But she created an idea, or she shared an idea of more of a grassroots, organic way of providing teachers um, to to meet. Genius Hour, I should have mentioned Genius Hour. Yes, Genius Hour is, is fantastic. It's Genius Hour for kids, Genius Hour for, for teachers. Um, Google that, there's tons of stuff uh, on that, so thanks, Peggy. Um, so how do we create collab time for this to happen? So I met with Janet, and she helped us to create this within our, uh, our school. And so what we've done is we've provided, uh, oh, first of all, we met in the, in the summer. And we did a little activity where people would share ideas. And, and we came up with just, what are you curious about? Um, and you should have seen the ideas that people had. Um, they wanted to, they're curious about self-regulation, technology, uh, literacy, but very specific questions they had, sort of a professional inquiry that they were cu curious about. So we put them all on the board. And then the teachers who are you know, very often primary teachers are very organized. So they organized them into themes. And, and so then you had people bouncing ideas off of each other. And it was very informal. And it was just, you know, I'm not going to tell you this is what we're going to learn. This is, I want to know what you are curious about. And so what we've done is we've provided um, just two periods on, on uh, sorry, uh, two to three periods on Tuesday and two to three periods on Thursday. And what I mean by two to three periods is we have our teacher librarian, we have our music teacher, and we have me available to cover classes, prep free for teachers. to meet. Um, I can offer time. I'll say, hey, you know what? I, I noticed you had a question about self-regulation and how we can, how we can help self-control in some of the classes or, or some sensory stuff in the classrooms. How about you meet with um, the teacher across the hall? How about we cover for that? So I can offer that, or teachers can come to me with a question. And, um, and so we do that on Tuesday and Thursday. So there's up to room for three teachers. Can you hear Chris? No. Nope.
I don't know why my sound keeps coming off there, but uh, sorry about that. I'm not touching it. <laughs> Maybe I'm talking too loud. Um, Okay, so it catches up. And I go into sort of chipmunk mode there, um, and what what this does. So we've had we've had pe teachers ask for time. They've asked for um, time to meet with other teachers, other staff, and we've had things from inquiry-based learning, self-regulation, literacy, art themes. Uh, so doing a theme for the entire intermediate end on art, and then and then plugging our walls up with all their art. Um, a teacher and support staff. Um, how often do you get to actually meet with your um, special education assistant or or your teaching assistant in if you have one or your special education teacher to meet to talk about some of the challenges and some of the strategies that need to to help in your class um, and what skills those need to be developed we've had often we do a musical um, see you Peggy um, we do a do a, a musical in the in our in our school and you know this is always done after or coach was always done after school, and so now we can provide team time within the schedule for people to to meet to to plan it to plan their season to plan their their um, their programs and and we've had some fantastic ideas and all this is this is not going to be the time all this is is time seed I call it seed time you plant the time the time is there to plant the seeds for this to grow and we have it right before lunch and that's purposely before lunch because teachers asked that hey you know if we're exploring an idea can we just keep going through lunch absolutely and they actually the conversation continues on the next day after school um, so it's just providing that time to get people excited about it and this is just a simple practical idea this is only taken we took two periods out of our LA so our learning assistance support we took two periods from um, one teacher and two periods from another, and we added two periods from me. So we're talking about six periods, and I think the impact is is much greater than providing those those two periods for LA support. I'm not I'm not saying LA support is not important, but what I'm saying is that this is an, this is a priority for us because I think innovation and passion is a priority for us. Um, the the one thing that we have to be careful of when we do when we talk about innovation is that we often think new is just so much better. Um, you know, if it's new and shiny, and if it's a, an idea that no one's ever thought of, let's do it. Um, and and really, we all know that's the case. Just because something's new doesn't mean it's good, and just because something's old doesn't mean it's bad. I think we need to to tap into the wisdom of our our people. Um, that have a lot of experiences and uh, experience in the system. I think we need to uh, look at research. So when I say strong, I think we need to look at the research that's out there um, and be well versed in that. And then also new and balance all of these. So not just totally focusing on everything that's new, but taking those strong ideas, those well researched ideas, and making them different, making them work for our students today. Um, and I think that balance is really important because we could get caught up in the shiny new things, especially when we talk about technology. Um, I know Pam Moran was talking about, um, um, you know, screen sheets, and so we have these shiny new technology that we're doing the same thing, and it's not not innovative. It's not actually enhancing our learning at all. So um, that can be a powerful way to create the conditions is to to provide time within the schedule, and and I hope that. This idea will that I've that I've not created on my own that I've stolen from other people that um, will help others in there. And the, one of the the big things that I haven't touched on is how we need to be a connector as as educational leaders. Uh, and again, I'm not talking about just formal leaders. As educational leaders, we need to connect. We need to connect people with within our own building. And by connecting, I don't mean with just technology. I mean connecting people across the hall, down the hall, to a different school, online any way to connect ideas because that is how ideas grow and if you're just doing something and you do something great in in your classroom I want those pockets of brilliance to be expanded beyond on into our school and hopefully beyond identity is something we've stolen from another another school um, this idea of the seed time we've we've stole, stolen from Janet all these things are ideas that we've we've taken and we've made it our own um, 
So I try to blog our stories. So if you look at my blog, a lot of the stuff I do is, is stuff that's sharing what's happening at our school. And I encourage others to share because that's where I steal ideas from. And and people are sometimes nervous about that. What I say to our staff is, you know, what is what is ordinary to you could be extraordinary to someone else. So just because you think this is kind of, well, this is just what I do, someone else is going to go, wow, I never thought of that. So um, we want to share. We want to be that connector. This is just a summary of some of the things that we've talked about today, uh, making innovation a priority. If it, if it is a priority, which it should be, you've got to provide the time. And we can't wait for the, uh, the government to give us more money. We've got to do it now. And so be creative in how you're going to provide that time. And focusing on strengths, balancing those traditions, research, innovation, and then sharing. Be that connector. Um, what I want to do right now is steal ideas from you. So uh, if you have any questions, or if Sarah or Mariana, if you, had, if you noticed any questions that, that you want me to expand on, uh, hopefully my mic didn't cut out for too long there. Um, and then also, if you have any other ideas, I'd love to hear them. Because we're just scratching the surface of our school, and I think we're going in the right direction. So I'd like to hear more ideas on how we can make that even better. So I'm going to turn my mic off. You can either speak up, you can write it in the chat. Um, and uh, Sarah or uh, Mariana, if you've seen anything you need me to touch on, then Please write it or speak. Thank you. Chris, uh, thank you so much for uh, this amazing presentation. Actually, you did say the most with the least through this slide. Uh, about your question that you posed, what are other ways to create the conditions for passion innovation in schools? Uh, one of my uh, professors, uh, Dr. Adriza Marie, uh, proposed a new method in teaching known as I. Uh, Mm, impromptu tutoring, that is, uh, you come up uh, in, with uh, new ideas in class uh, at least. I think it is one of the um, main uh, cause for passion and innovation because you are not prepared. You just uh, come up uh, with new ideas in class by co uh, collaborating and sharing with others. I would be happy to know. In your ideas and so on. Thank you so much. I think I caught most of that. So my mind was cutting out at my end. It might be in my connection. Um, but you talked about um, in cl just basically in the moment in class, one of the professors is doing that. Is that is that correct? Uh, yes, Chris. Uh, it is uh, known as impromptu tutoring. I will uh, write it down on the chat box. That um, the uh, students and the teacher all together uh, come up with, um, I mean, ad lib uh, ideas in a class, and I think it is useful because uh, you do not prepare for what you say. You just come up with innovative ideas. And I think it's really one of the ways for innovating in schools. It can be used there. I like that idea. So impromptu tutoring. So yeah, within a class, you can do that. There was a question, um, Karen, if, is Karen still here? Uh, how do you know time is being used productively? How do you keep teachers excited about this? And one of the things that Janet, who's the one who introduced it to me, said to me was keep that time um, in demand. And because if someone is not using it very effectively, then like I said, it's not equitable. So I don't have to give that time to everybody equally. I can I can give it to the people who are really really running with it. And um, I, and it, it does sound a little bit top down when I say it like that, but it is very grassroots because people are coming to me and asking for it. And um, I don't. I mean, I check in. I definitely check in to see how things are going. But um, I think that we need to trust our staff. Um, I've. I've been able to hire some fantastic teachers at our staff, and we've got some people that have been there for a long time. Um, and uh, yeah, they're, they're just they're running with it, and I want to provide support for that. Now, if someone wasn't using it very well, then we just have a conversation around it. And I've made it very clear it's not for prep, uh, so it's not for your typical prep stuff, photocopying or, or lesson planning, um, but it can be for program planning. So it can be working with another teacher to change some of your units or change some of the, the way you teach you know, providing more cross-curricular um, learning for, for students and, and things like that. But um, if it was to happen, I, yeah, I would just have a, a pretty simple conversation about, about what the time is to be used for, because it isn't in demand. I've, I've got I do it two weeks ahead of time, and uh, I basically have to say no right now to some people, because um, 
you know, we just don't have enough time in our schedule right now for it. But uh, you know, this was that was done purposefully because I think um, we want it to be in demand, and then we can build from there after that. Any other questions? I can go back here and, and look. Any other ideas that I can steal? <laughs> Hi, Chris. Well, there was a question posted by Laura. I don't know if she got the answer. Uh, how do you do? How do you do the twenty percent time? How do you set that up, Chris? And uh, did the kids like that term FedEx? It was asked by Peggy, even though she left. So maybe you can just quickly uh, describe. Thank you. I didn't catch the second part of your question about the kids, um, but the first part was um, how do we set up the 20% time? And we don't we, we don't have enough time in our schedule for 20%. So the two ways that I've done it is is just providing the seed time is, is through the FedEx prep, and that's where I provided prep time uh, for eight classes over over either eight week uh, anywhere from two weeks to eight weeks, and it was just for something that was above and beyond, and you just wanted time to explore, and it worked, um, but but it was very isolated. It was just one teacher. She was working on her on, on by herself. They were all females. That's why I said she. Um, and so what we did was we built towards the the seed time, uh, the learning time, where we have three teachers that are available to cover classes, drink twice a week for 45 minutes. And uh, again, this is just very small, but it's a good start. And I think it could work in, in most schools. And uh, Janet would say the same thing. It, it doesn't cost you anything. It, it, we didn't add anything. What we did is we reprioritized. We looked at our priorities and we shifted them. Uh, we had we had L learning assistance as scheduled for there, and we shifted time, um, and we thought this is this is more important because this can have a significant impact on all all our students, and uh, maybe we can relook our our LA support in a different way. Thank you, Chris. It was a wonderful presentation, and uh, uh, I would uh, just like to congratulate you. And has a question, and I have given uh, more uh, privileges for the mic, so please, you thank you. Raman, would you like to use talk button below video? Ed made a good comment there. Um, it's not really about the individual things. It's about the, the all coming together, and that's exactly it. And um, that's where the management comes in, because I think that um, if you don't create the structures, structures when the school within the school to happen, if, if all of your structures are about information and your staff meetings are very directed, and your professional learning and your professional development days are are bringing people in that that certain people decide is is great, then you have no opportunity for that. So it's creating that culture. Um, where people can explore their strengths and and you know you can tap into those and so it is truly I'm so honored to work with the staff that I have here and um, and I have worked with other good other good staffs as well but there's something special about this and and uh, and we have a lot of leaders that within that are are, are moving us in in great directions. Hi there, Chris. I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your staff meetings and how they would run uh, other than just being a sort of an informational piece. Thanks, Robin. Good to see you here. Um, Robin came and uh, visited our school last year, so it's good to see him here. Any, yeah, staff meetings. So um, as I said before, we have in BC we have 15 hours to meet total at, for staff meetings, and so the question that was posed to me by my previous assistant superintendent was, what's the best use of that time? And so the best use of that time is not for me to go and just talk. <laughs> so we spend about a half hour on information that or decisions that we need to make that that kind of affects the day to day stuff or you know we have a, a presenter come in for a ten minutes to talk about you know uh, how to help kids with uh, that have severe allergies and, and things like that and then we have um, we set an hour at the start so our staffings are three to four thirty from three to four is professional learning and it's always discussion based it's we take a topic like homework and we say oh, okay and we propose some questions on what we feel about homework and so I blogged our uh, about homework and, and how we've moved away from um, 
homework in our schools and, and why. And so that's come from our staff meetings. And uh, so we talk about literacy, we talk about uh, numeracy, all of the sort of um, things that are important in schools. And uh, but it is very discussion based, and we want to we want to leave there with something. We don't just talk about it and talk about something, and we don't leave with an action. So we have something we want to leave. Uh, leave that meeting with, and then from 4 to 4.30, that's the business side. I think that professional learning should happen first, because if you're having a great conversation, sometimes you even just cut out the business side. Um, but, you know, that's, I think that people are tired at the end of the day, and if you have the professional learning at the end, uh, I think that people are just even more tired. So that's, uh, that's how I try to, to do it. It doesn't work every time, but I think that's how I try to set up our staff meetings. Um, focusing on professional learning because that's the only time, I shouldn't say it's the only time, but pretty close to the majority of the time that we get together as a staff is during staff meetings. I didn't realize Ed was uh, Edna, what Ed said, yes, I'd love to. I love learning your stuff, read your blog on a regular basis, so um, tons of innovation is happening uh, that you're sharing. Um, from your school as well as some of the schools that you visit. Uh, Jen, it says, can you repeat the name of the person? Uh, absolutely, she'd love to help anybody who's looking at it, and I highly recommend her um, her dissertation. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to post my blog, a little self-promotion here, um, because it does mention her name as well. Her name is Janet Lauman, um, but her on my blog post I actually have a link to her uh, dissertation, and uh, and then her name is on there as well. So I'm just going to get back here and. So there's the post that describes it, and and most of the links are on my. Um, on my the page here as well as the slides. The slides are all on SlideShare and I'll post them on Twitter again. Um, yeah, but if, if uh, other, I'm just going to look back here, any other questions that I missed? There's my mic back, there we go. Um, okay, well, if there's no further questions, um, I just want to say thank you for um, for coming and uh, sharing some of your questions. Um, what we're doing, again, at our school, we're just scratching the surface. Hopefully, you can take some of these ideas and make them better and then share them, and then I can steal them back and make, make our school even better. Um, there's lots of ways to connect with me here. Um, so thank you so much, Sarah and Mariana. It's been a real honor to work with you today, and it's been an honor to be part of the Reform Symposium. Um, I look forward to learning. I have two sick kids, so we'll see how many I can, uh, sessions I can attend. But uh, thanks for coming today. And if you have any further questions, there's all the information there. Uh, my slides will be posted on my SlideShare, uh, or they are posted there. And uh, enjoy um, Reform Symposium, and uh, thanks again. Thank you so much, Chris. It was uh, indeed brilliant. Uh, I'm sure everyone uh, enjoyed uh, your presentation. Thank you all and have a nice day. Bye-bye. Thanks, Sarah.